Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending upon where in the world you're joining us from today. Uh, welcome to Live from the Ranch. Once again, my co-host this week is Juliana de Willems of JW Dog Training and Behavior in the Washington, D.C. area. Hi, Juliana. How are you doing today? Welcome to uh, Live from the Ranch. I don't see you yet. There you are. How are you doing? Hey, Ken. I am great. How are you doing? I am doing well. Uh, it's early in the morning where I am today, so uh, good morning is the right uh, thing to say to me because uh, I am still down under in Australia. Wow. So, uh, so how's how, how have you been? I haven't seen you since last uh, last last broadcast. I know, and this one being on the first of the month, it came right up. It feels like we were just recently doing our last month's broadcast. So it's been great, but nothing is going to compare to like being in Australia. <laughs> no, 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 it's been fun. I've been doing some uh, some speaking and consulting and stuff like that and seeing some great wildlife. And uh, it's been a it's been a wonderful time. And uh, speaking of having a wonderful time, I wanted to remind everybody that our broadcast live from the ranch is sponsored by the Karen Pryor Academy. So I want to remind people, if you're interested in enhancing your understanding of modern, effective, positive dog training or build a stronger bond with your dog or take the next step toward a fulfilling career as a dog trainer, our, do our dog trainer courses will support support you every step of the way. I encourage you to check out our online introductory courses or explore upcoming locations to earn certification as a professional dog trainer. Not only is Juliana one of our, 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 our certified dog trainers, so is our guest today, Kiki. She's got, uh, Kiki has uh, workshops coming up in Des Moines, Nashville, and Salt Lake City. So if you want to learn more, go to KarenPriorAcademy.com. But with that, I'm ready to get started. You know what we're going to talk about this week is we're going to talk all about barking. People often have questions about how to stop barking from taking place. And uh, our guest this week uh, often has done a lot of work with uh, with understanding barking. Our guest is Kiki Yablon. She is a KPA certified training partner, a certified professional dog trainer, knowledge assessed through CPDT. Uh, she's also a Karen Pryor Academy faculty member and a co-instructor for Susan Friedman's Behavior Works. She holds a master's degree in applied behavior science. Uh, Kiki came to Clicker Training in 2005 as the novice owner of an under-socialized adolescent shelter dog named Pigeon. Uh, she had the good fortune to live next door to a marine mammal trainer who introduced her to Karen Pryor's work, which in turn led Kiki to her first mentor. Uh, the fellow ex Expo presenter, Laura monaco Torelli, who's been here on live from the ranch herself. After briefly wandering in the under-regulated training wilderness, Kiki attended and graduated from KPA. And she now focuses a lot of time in her own business, Kiki Yablon Dog Training. And some of Kiki's interests include excessive barking, which, of course, we're going to talk about today, a proactive puppy raising, loose leash walking, and unusual problem behaviors. And she likes to say, and lazy solutions that let a well-designed environment do most of the work. I love, I love that last statement. Kiki, welcome to Live from the Ranch. Thanks for having me. Uh, well, I love 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 having you. I, I think uh, I think our viewers are going to enjoy listening to uh, the things that you have to say. But I'm curious. Um, we've often it seems like barking comes up a lot, in, and you're you have an interest in 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 helping people deal with barking dogs. Where does that interest come from? Just because you've dealt with it yourself, or is it just because you have a lot of clients who've asked questions about how do I stop my dog from barking? Um, it comes up a lot with clients um, and it, I, I just think it's such an interesting behavior to look at because it's not really a behavior. It's, it's sort of like talking, like talking, we could say talking is a behavior, but it's really sort of a class of behaviors. And what's interesting is to look at why, if you want to stop someone from talking, then you probably <laughs> should f figure out why they're talking. Um, you know, so, what purpose so it's serving. So, so that's yeah. interesting. So if, if a client calls you and, and let's say I'm contacting you for the first time and I say, Kiki, my dog barks all the time. How do I stop it from happening? What are the, what kinds of questions do you ask me to kind of understand what I'm dealing with? Um, 
Well, even though it can feel like they're barking all the time, they probably aren't. So the first things that I tend to ask are when they're barking and what is going on in their, in, in their context when they're barking. Um, and then if they're barking at the owner, I'm, I want to look at what the owner, how the owner is responding to the barking. If they're barking at things in the environment, I want to know uh, what's happening. You know, if they bark at the mailman, does the mailman go away to use a really simple example? Um, sort of looking for the antecedents and consequences related to barking as well as some bigger picture things, you know, uh, but those are the, those are the first questions I'm asking. So, okay. and, 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 and in, in talking with you about this in the past, I, I, I understand that, that when COVID hit and people ended up being on zoom or being <laughs> on their screens, even more often, uh, did you see a, a rise in cases or was it just a, a, a new problem had developed because people were ignoring their dogs while they were in Zoom meetings? Um, I mean, anecdotally, I heard a lot and I read some stories in like the newspapers and stuff about uh, people whose pets were doing, you know, doing things um, that they found, you know, alternately cute or annoying while they were trying to be on Zoom all day. So. Well, the entire and the entire so, family is home and trying to be on Zoom all day. So big context change for the dogs, <laughs> and a good opportunity I, I, I for them imagine. to learn that um, that doing certain things while your owner is on Zoom is going to immediately get your owner to get up and do something. Um, so, 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 so what have what have you found are, are some of the most common contexts under which the barking occurs? I mean, certainly the being on a Zoom meeting and your dog's barking for attention is probably one of those. Are there other common or popular situations that tend to that tend to come up that people want your help with? Um, I mean, I think I can't think of a situation in which barking maybe doesn't occur sometimes. <laughs> Um, it's such a normal dog behavior. So, uh, and dogs learn, I think, pretty quickly that it works for a lot of things when other behaviors that they have are not working. So you you talked about trying to figure out if if you were you were saying I want to get my get this person to stop talking. Your question was figuring out why they're talking. So I assume then that one of the first questions that you're trying to get to is why is the dog barking and how do you tease out the reasons as, as you know, is it, does it, is it through the questions you ask and what are you looking for as you're trying to assess what causes or what the function is of the barking? Yeah. And I, I'm glad that you said that. So causes, when we, when we think causes as humans, we tend to think like A happens before B. So A caused B, right. but a lot of times it's what happens after the dog barks that is going to cause future barking to increase. Um, so I don't know, some, some interesting ones. I mean, some, sometimes it, it seems pretty obvious, like the, the, the mailman makes a banging sound on your porch and the dog barks and the mailman goes away and that's all that ever happens with the mailman. And so, uh, you know, there's probably an element of startling, of startle in there too. But I think right. once the, once the dog barks, cause there's out of a startled, you know, response, then they learn that the sound goes away. But um, some interesting cases that I was thinking, like an interesting case I had last summer was where um, every time I sat down to work on my computer, I was dog sitting for someone in Maine. And every time I sat down to work on my computer, one of the dogs would go around and bark out the windows. And this dog did bark at things that were going by, but a lot of these times there was nothing going by. And so I just observed for a while and the dog would sort of bark out the windows and then kind of kind of look over at me. <laughs> um, and so that gave me a little bit of a, a clue about maybe, you know, maybe it's something that the owner, um, the, the caregiver was doing that, or maybe something I had been doing that, that made the dog expect that if they barked out the window, something would happen. And so I wasn't there as a trainer, um, but I did, I, I, communicated with the, the dog's caregiver a bit and found out that uh, often what she would do to sort of put the kibosh on that while she was working is get up and play with them for a while. And he also, and this is where the bigger context comes in, he had restricted access to toys because he had a history of 
uh, if left alone with toys, he would ingest big pieces of them and had had surgery. So he was sort of toy, uh, he had limited access to toys and I think had found that doing this behavior um, pretty quickly got somebody to get up and get him something to do. Now, that's interesting because in that particular case, you were house sitting. So you were able to do the observations yourself and sort of assess what was going on. If that hadn't been a case where you were in the location, do you find sometimes that it's hard to find the relevant information that maybe the client doesn't always know what they should share? So they don't think to share the fact that toys are being restricted or that or, or other issues. How, how do you how do you? ask the questions to get the relevant information from your client. Yeah, um, it's kind of an, inter an interview process. And then also sometimes you do get to go and observe and sometimes you can ask them to send video. Although interestingly, I think sometimes when, when, when you ask them to take video, they don't do on video what they normally would do because <laughs> they're on video. <laughs> right, um, right. Uh, I mean, yeah, sometimes, it, sometimes there is a bit of, of uh, puzzling, so. But I think and, it helps to not say it in a blamey way, like, well, what are you doing when the dog barks, you know? Right, um, right, right. How but are, it is what are you doing to reward question. it? So. It is an important question to ask, though. In other words, so yeah. your yeah. dog starts barking while you're on a Zoom call, for example. How do you react? Yeah. What do you? What is your response? Uh, yeah. and are, are most people aware of what their responses are? Are they pretty accurate when telling you, well, I do this or I do that? Or are they unaware of what they're doing? Um, I think they are aware uh, of what they do in many cases. Um, they just may not be aware of the connection between what they do and what the dog does next time the same situation comes up. And you've had this situation happen to yourself. You've had a, a, a barky dog yourself at certain times, but I either, either you've solved it because I don't hear any barking or your dog's not there with you right now. Um, <laughs> Which is... He's here. He's a, this is Finn. Um, he is, uh, he's new to me, um, but I've known him for a long time. Um, he's, I've known him for five years and he okay. definitely has certain situations where he barks a lot. Um, so, and there, and I have actually done almost nothing about it yet <laughs> uh -huh. um because i think this is the case with a lot of dog trainers like dog behavior just doesn't bother me that much and when i get home i'm tired and the barking lasts for like two seconds and then you know it's over so um but today i will demonstrate uh what i plan to do and what i would help might help a client do with the type of barking he does which is often a situation where I, I might be able to tell you what the antecedent is. Like there's something, if somebody squeaks a gate out front or is on the porch uh, or delivering a package, but I don't know about it until it is already happening and the dog is already um, barking. And so, so. What, 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 is, what is your plan if you do, do decide to deal with those kinds of situations what kind of a protocol are you thinking of putting in place? Um, so I have a, 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 a sort of a protocol. It, I, I really hesitate to call it my protocol, though it gets attributed to me a lot because I think lots of people do different versions of this. Um, but it's you'll see it referred to as the thank you protocol. Um, and basically what it involves is you can't get ahead of the antecedent and also you don't control the reinforcer. So these are the types of situations where I would use this. So if, if, if the reinforcer for that, I mean, I've tried doing nothing when he barks at the sound outside and he just sort of keeps barking until the sound goes away. So that's sort of how I'm assessing that he's barking for the sound to go away and, and maybe not for me to get up right. and do something. Um, but I don't control whether the sound goes away or not. So I can't do anything with that reinforcer. Sure. And I also can't get ahead of this behavior the way I might get ahead of if a dog is barking at people who are walking down the street. You can see them coming a mile away. But, you know, here the barkings are the barking is how I know there's somebody out there. Um, and I also don't mind some of that. I like a little bit of notice that there's somebody uh -huh. on my porch. Um, so I train up a cue. In, when I wrote it up, I used thank you just because I figured people couldn't say it in a 
an angry way. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, you could say whatever you want. You could say, knock it off. You could say, that's enough. You could, you could click. Um, you could do anything that basically is going to be a cue to the dog that there is going to be a big feed of yummy treats. Um, and I like to often have that come in a predictable location okay. because I find if, if you say a certain word and it means that there's going to be a shower of treats in this corner or under the treat jar, or you can even be the location if you want to wear a treat pouch around your house, or you can be the location. And when, when you say thank you, you go to some place and the dog knows to get ready to follow you. But I like there to be some predictability, not just about the treats, but about the location of the treats, because then you tend to see the dog start to anticipate that when you say the word and head towards that location. So you can Excellent. be kind of strategic about where I, it is. I know that you have uh, Finn set up there to possibly demonstrate that. Are you able to demonstrate what that looks like or is it not yeah. possible because there's no antecedent, there's no noise going out on the outside or? Um, so I actually recommend training this cue when there is no antecedent oh, outside. I want it pre-trained so that um, so that when I start using it, when the dog's barking at something outside, um, they already know what to do. Excellent. So this is this is how you might start the process up if you you don't have to worry about waiting for the the the, the thing that causes the barking. You can start when yeah. the animal's not barking. Yeah. Um, do you want me to explain sort of where that where it goes from there first or demonstrate sure. first? Um, I'm not sure. Whatever you think is going to make the most sense. I, 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 I think maybe we could better understand where to go from there if we see the process okay. in place. So why don't we take a look at that actual, uh, at the actual training or the protocol or the thing that you currently do. So, oh, there's okay. another angle. I see you there's from the side. Fin. Yeah. And he's laying um, down. Yeah. So, um, so I can't take full credit for this. Um, his previous family, uh, he was good at hanging around while they were working and not expecting things. But for me, um, I, when I work on Zoom, sometimes I want him to demo with me. So for him, I want to be really clear. This is sort of a more preventive thing. I want to be really clear about when food is available from me at this desk and when it's not. Okay. Um, because my previous dog, I did a lot of reinforcing her for being on the mat next to me. And if my rate of reinforcement dropped, she would sort of like whine a little bit. <laughs> uh, not nothing terrible, but you know. So I want to be clear from the outset with Finn. So um, for, <laughs> you hear your name. Um, <laughs> so I have an OXO pop top jar here, yep. and when I pop the lid off of that, and it's open, then treats are available. And when it's closed, I'm not uh, going to open it unless there is quiet behavior. So, gotcha. um, so I'm going to just open it. So we know that food is available. You can see the little ears prick up. Um, so I'm going to say the T words, <laughs> um, and then I'm going to get treats out of the, I'm going to get up, get treats out of this and take them and sprinkle them in the snuffle mat. And I want okay, you know, Kiki, the thank before you we, before we, yeah, I was just going to suggest, I was just going to say, Just that we, that we see what you're doing and the dog doing. So I'm going to uh, uh, ask Sarah if she can make yeah. that happen. I know it's a, uh, we're still learning this particular platform. We're trying to figure out the best way to, to make uh, your screen the big screen. Cool. Okay, um, go ahead and, and work. Yeah, you're good. good. So I want everything that um, predicts treats in there to come after the word thank you. So, thank you. And so it's going to take him a long time to eat that. If the mailman was here, the mailman is also probably going to leave before he's done. 
I'm getting a little feedback. I'm getting a double um, sound from myself. There we we, go. we hear you loud and clear. We can hear you okay, fine. Good. Good. Thank you. So um, if, 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 if would you expect that he would if the if the mailman were to show up in the middle of this would he, that interrupt the the eat treat eating behavior or would he probably keep on eating? Um, at this point, I don't know. I, yeah. I don't, that's the first time I've done it, so I doubt it would keep him here. Right. Right. So, and so right. you would do that. You would do that periodically, whenever just uh, just to get him used to the fact that opening that box, that 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 thing of treats. I know the sound. I have the exact same thing with my dogs. Um, that that opening it up means treats are available, and you'd say thank you, and you give him a shower in with those treats like you did just there. And how often might you do that? Assuming there's nothing bad going on in the background, and you're just trying to train it. Do you actually do a session focused on that, or do you just intersperse that throughout your work day while you're on Zoom or while you're working at your desk? I might do some repetitions, but I don't want to beat it to death. Um, I don't want him to get to the point where he's sick of the treats right. in a single session. And of course, as soon as you do that, now that the treat bat thing is open, he's no longer sleeping. He's just right there at your feet looking yeah. at you. Is that, I would assume that's to be expected, but you don't necessarily want that forever, do you? you you'd hope you'd no. just go back to sleep. No. And we're kind of conflating two things here. One is the when are treats available when I'm at my desk. And the other is thank you. So I might have treats somewhere else in the house and that I wouldn't be worried about like I am here. Okay. So real briefly, we're gonna we need to take a break here pretty soon, but why don't uh why don't we um let Finn uh, do whatever he wants to do, and we'll just you and I'll talk for a second. What happens next? So you 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 regularly trained this. It's going well. He's doing well. You're happy with how it's going. What are the next steps to use the thank you protocol? Oh, here, hold on a minute, Kiki. You're on mute. I think. Okay. There you, Can you are. Hear me now. Yep. yep. You're back. Um. So I want to make sure I. Until until I have that a really enthusiastic response to that, it's basically like teaching a recall. Um, right. It's like a little mini in-house recall, um, or it could be an in-yard recall. So I think the easiest way to talk about this might be how to talk about how I came up with the protocol with my previous dog Pigeon. Um, she barked at uh, people going by the front of our house. She would run down the side of our house. There's a narrow sidewalk and there's a chain link fence there where she could see the street. And if something passed by there while we were in the backyard together, she would haul down there and just like Tasmanian devil um, <laughs> at, the, at the gate, like just snarling and twirling and hackles up and all of that stuff. And I could not uh, call her back with my recall when she was like that. So I did not... Uh, pre-train a new cue at that point, now I would probably do so. Um, but at the time, what I did was try to make it easier for her to respond to the recall that she had. So I made a commitment that if we were going to, if she was in the yard, I was in the yard. And if I was in the yard with her, I had chicken. Um, and so if she ran down the gangway snarling, I just would walk up and literally be two feet behind her and I would whistle, which was our recall cue. And if she so much as gave me a dirty look, I would give her a bunch of chicken. Right. Um, now I probably would just give the chicken whether she gave me a dirty look or not. <laughs> I would just start producing chicken so that she knew if I made this whistle sound, I'm getting chicken out. Um, but so over the course of a summer, what started to happen is a I didn't have to uh, like I would when I followed her, she would turn more easily when I whistled. And then I was able to like go only go partway down the gangway. And then I was able to call her back from, you know, staying seated at the table in the backyard. And then what I noticed is that if she started to run down the gangway and I was a little late getting my whistle out um, of my mouth, she would kind of pause like the dog who was looking out the window and like give me a look back over her shoulder. Uh -huh. And that reminded me of a video I had seen by Karen Pryor, 
um, where she talks about how to mess up a what we call a chain in KPA, like how to mess up a sequence that's held together by cues. Right. Right. So she has somebody, um, she has people holding up the cues that are, that that's like turn, clap, click, treat. And so she has them turn and the woman turns until she gets the clap cue. When she gets the clap cue, she claps. When she claps, she gets the click and then give, gets a chocolate. And what they did in the demonstration was she had the first guy kind of flick the turn sign and then the clap sign was late or didn't come. And she started, she knew the sequence. So she was starting to turn and then she was just like starting to clap earlier and earlier because the clapping is the behavior that's closest to the reward, right? So, um, so what happened is the first behavior got smaller and shorter and got weakened because the cue that was reinforcing it got pulled out. Right. And then she went to the second part of the sequence faster to get to, because that was still getting clicked and treated. And so I decided to try that with Pigeon. So I, I, when she started to run down the gangway, I didn't call her. And then when she turned around, then I called her. Um, and so what happened is the, the barking just got more and more sort of perfunctory to the point where she would sort of kind of, she would take a couple steps down the gangway and then look at me and I'd be like, yes, good job. <laughs> you know, come get your, come get your chicken. Um, and we were able to eliminate almost all of her barking um, by That's basically, great. basically teaching her to do it for chicken instead of to make people go away. Um, and we probably also reduce the aversiveness of there being people out front by, you know, associating them with chicken. So. Oh, that's great. I love that. You know, I, I, I know some of our, our, our viewers have questions about that protocol. I'd love to save the questions for the end because what I'd like to do next is talk a little bit about your master's thesis, which was focused on barking. But before we go to the master's thesis, I, I just want to take a quick break and tell people a little bit about our KPA live courses. Um, they're a brand new kind of course that we started offering. Uh, Karen Prior Academy live group virtual classes are normally from four to six weeks in length, and they feature real-time training and coaching with fabulous teachers. One of the upcoming classes includes Hesitant Hounds, Encouraging Courage with Sarah McLeodry, which is enrolling right now. You can enroll today. And I'll be bringing back my snake avoidance training class, which was very popular last year, and it's opening for enrollment very soon on June 14th. So you can get more information at KarenPriorAcademy.com. So Having given you all of that information, I wanted to jump back and we'll get to some of the great questions that I see coming in. Um, and I will um, would like to start uh, by asking you about your master's thesis. I, 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 I know you did your master's thesis on barking, but describe in more detail what you were doing and what you were hoping to, to find out or what you were really studying when you were doing your master's thesis. Um, so, uh, so my master's thesis um, had to, I was ready to run a, ma a different thesis and then COVID hit and all in-person research was shut down. <laughs> and so I had to think about what I might be able to do over Zoom. Um, and I was, as we were talking about earlier, I was reading about how people were having problems with um, their dogs barking at them while they were on Zoom. Um, and I had just before COVID hit, I had had a dog that um, I had had a client where the dog barked um, at the owners. Um, at the, I'm trying to switch to saying caregivers, sorry. The, the caregivers um, uh, when they had guests and the, the reinforcer for that was that the, um, one of the caregivers would train the dog. <laughs> so the training the dog like treats on a mat was the reinforcer for the barking when there were guests there, right? So they, they might try to start with the dog on the mat while there are guests there. And they also, if they forgot to do that and the dog started barking at them when there were guests, then they would get the mat out. Um, and I had also had a client where that was happening on Zoom. And I had done this, I had been, uh, using variations of a certain procedure. And I decided to test that 
um, for my thesis. So the procedure uh -huh. was, um, I think, so I think let, 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 kind of back up a minute and, and talk about what, how that might happen. Yeah. Right. So often I think basically this happens when we bungle um, our usual DRA differential reinforcement of alternative behavior. If I don't want the dog to bark at me while I'm eating dinner or uh, having guests or on the phone or on zoom, then I am going to pick another behavior like settle on a mat or lay down and I'm going to reinforce the dog for that. And we often do not have the type of duration on that behavior that we need to have a dinner party, um, a full dinner party without reinforcing the dog or a full phone call or, you know, during COVID like eight hours of working on zoom. Um, it's, it, that's a lot of duration to have built on right. that behavior. Um, so with the, um, with the, the folks that I had before COVID, um, I, the first thing I did was try to teach them to build duration. Well, actually, the first thing I did was have them put the mat and the food completely away and see if their presence in the environment, if them not being there helped, but it didn't. The guests uh -huh. were definitely the cue that food is available if you bark. Um, so the first thing I did was have um, teach her how to build duration because she didn't, she was sort of feeding through the whole thing. And she did an um, amazing job between sessions. She built, I think, 15 minutes of duration. And then when I looked at that picture, I was, I, I thought, you know what, this is still not really what I want to see. Like, right. I don't want to see people like wearing their treat pouch every time they have people over and, and, and the dog like vibrating and trying to stay in one place right. to, you know, I mean, he wasn't vibrate. He was, he looked pretty calm, but still around that 15 minute mark where he was expecting the, the, the click and treat, he was kind of like, you know, and I was like, this is not, this isn't really the whole, like, can I, can we just step back and think about the big picture here? What do we actually want? Right. Right. Um, I don't want, I don't maybe necessarily want to have to feed the dog during the, that, you know, I'm happy. I, I'm happy to share food with my dog during dinner, but like, I might not want this, you know, so a, a client might not want this during a dinner party or a zoom call. The other thing is that when you're working on zoom and you're doing this, at some point your attention gets divided and your rate of reinforcement plummets and the dog lets you know, right? They, <laughs> right. they go back to uh, other behaviors that they have done to get food, um, which might include throwing some other behaviors at you. But if those don't work either, um, you might, you're likely to get barking. Right. Especially if you have reinforced barking before by getting up and being like, Shh, here's a bully stick. Right. right. So, um, so what I was thinking about doing is I wanted to try this procedure that I had done with clients where if you just change the rules, like if you just tell people, okay, just now you're just going to ignore the barking. That's sort of a recipe for disaster. They've tried to ignore it. They're in a position where they can't ignore it. Um, and that leads to an escalation an extinction burst. Uh, escalation in barking or in one case like going and pulling all the cushions off the couch doing other unignorable behaviors and then when we when then when we move to stop those we tend to reinforce these big um, unignorable bursts of behavior so if we are going to change the rules for how to get reinforcement then the idea of the experiment was where it might help to put something new in the environment that will get attached to the new set of rules as a, as a cue. So what I had um, folks do, I recruited for three dogs who, um, three subjects who um, barked persistently long duration at their caregivers while they were on Zoom. And one of the first thing I did was just try to test whether Zoom was really the antecedent. So I right. set them up. Uh, we observed for five minutes with the, uh, the person talking to me on Zoom and no food in the environment. And usually these folks had some kind of like food toys 
down for the dogs or they had um, a container of treats like I have on my desk. Um, I'm sure many of our listeners are familiar with this setup. <laughs> and for one of the dogs, when there was no food on the desk, he came in, he looked around, he curled up away from the owner, laid down and did not vocalize for the entire five minutes. <laughs> so I think that's a good lesson to always um, verify your antecedents. Don't just, We talk a lot about consequences, but look, a lot of times your antecedents are your easiest solution. And I'm so not just talking about that? blocking blocking the behavior from happening. Right. So in that situation, for example, the, the client had assumed it was me being on Zoom that causes the barking, but it turned out it was maybe her being on Zoom and food being in the environment that caused the barking. Zoom was superfluous. It turned right. out that um, that it was when she, it, it also happened when she was like eating a snack or popcorn or dinner. Um, so they had various solutions for that. Like they might um, reinforce the dog for uh, sitting on a climb during dinner, or they might crate the dog if they're going to have popcorn. Um, yeah. Um, so we kept that dog in the study, but instead of Zoom, like when I mean, we did it on Zoom, but what she did to set things up was she she had a bowl of snacks that she was eating that were also edible for the dog so they could be used as a reinforcer. Gotcha. Um, and then the other two dogs um, vocalized, even though the there was no food um, in the environment, it was put away. And so, what was the protocol? We're 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 actually running short on time here, I'm but I'm, I'm, I'm no, that's okay. I just yep. uh, I love this description, yep. but I kind of wanted to get what was the protocol that you actually put in place, and and maybe we could look yep. at one of your clients in just a minute and show us yes. before and the, after. The, so the protocol was, um, you're going to put the scarf up. Then you, then you start whatever it is that usually cues the barking. And we have uh, the criteria, the procedure was called differential reinforcement of other behavior, which is actually, you're not actually reinforcing any other behaviors, you're reinforcing the absence of the vocalization for a certain amount of time. Right. So the time, the initial time criterion was very, very low, like three or four seconds. Right. Um, and then uh, because it was an experiment, it was a little more rigid than I've done it with clients. And I, there's some, some things that about the experiment that I would change if I were doing more research on it. But uh, basically if they got it three times in a row, at least without the timer reset. So if they vocalize the timer reset and if the timer uh, went off with no vocalization, then the scarf was removed and the dog, was, the reinforcer was delivered. And I had also done an assessment to make sure that food was uh, reinforcing this behavior or to assess that whether food was reinforcing. So, um, and then, so if the timer was reset a certain number of times, the, the time criterion went down. And if they got it three times in a row with no resetting, then the criterion was incremented up a little bit. Um, okay. And over eight, like eight meetings with them on Zoom. Um, two of the dogs uh, got to the final criterion, which was five minutes without vocalization three times in a row. And and so that was a situation where when the scarf was tied on the back of their chair, uh, food was not available and that's what they learned? Food was not available and barking would not be, uh, or vocalization would not be reinforced. But if a certain amount of time went by, then the scarf would go away and they would get the same stuff that they had been barking. Well, that's fascinating. Yeah. That's interesting. So I know we have some video of one of your, one of your clients. Um, can we look at the video, the unsuccessful video first, and then we'll look at the one that was successful and maybe you can talk a little bit about what happened there. Does that yeah. make sense? I think it might be best to look at two from the same dog. So one, yes, the, the one I, where there's food in the environment with Team B, food in the environment. Yeah, that's that's video number two. We're going to look at what we what what we have up as video number two. We'll take a look at that. And uh, it, this was unsuccessful, right? Okay. So sit down, take the food out, put it on the counter, open the laptop, and then say hello to me. Okay. 
All right, I'm starting the timer now. I think a better one for to look at. Hi. Be... Okay, never mind. Never mind. I'm sorry. I, I, my mistake. Okay. So sit down, take the food out, put it on the counter, open the laptop, and then say hello to me. All right. I'm starting the timer now. Hello. Hi. All right. So he's definitely a little. Um, yeah. Now he's uh, like, hey. Yeah. I don't know if you can. I don't want him to be out of your view. No. I think we're all right. Yeah. There yeah. we go. Okay. That's super interesting. Yeah, it is interesting. <laughs> and I'm just ignoring him, right? Yep, you're just ignoring him and talking to me, and we're just going to measure how much of this he does if we give it five minutes. Okay. Um, so... Uh, I'll talk to my advisor, but I don't necessarily think this um, takes you out of the experiment. Okay. Um, I think like if, if you were a client of mine, I would have you try, just don't have food out. Right. Um, but in terms of seeing if this intervention works when there is when the, the situation is in place, um, yeah. I, think, I, I think we can still do it. So <laughs> I'm trying to talk a little quieter so that I don't block out any barking. Yeah. All right. So that was that was just the start of that particular that particular protocol where you were you were trying to. to just to get a sense of how much barking was going on. Yeah. And I thought it was interesting when you said, let me check with my advisor. Why were you wanting to do that? You were, you were. Uh, because were the previous video. Between being a good trainer for your client in that moment and following the protocol that you needed to follow for your, for your project. Um, so the, the original recruiting and the thing I got approved. So these weren't clients. These were part, people I recruited for the study. So they weren't, they weren't clients of mine otherwise. Um, it was for dogs barking while people were on zoom was the problem, but this was the dog where in the pre, like just, just five minutes before that we had put, um, we had taken food out of the environment and let the dog in the room and he did absolutely no vocalization and just laid down. But what I was saying is I, I don't, cause she seemed worried like, oh, then I can't participate in your experiment. And I was like, gotcha. no, I think, um, I think you can, we just set up the. The, the, the antecedent conditions are that you're eating and or you have food out and not um, right the zoom okay so so look can we watch the next one where where you were you did have some success and then and that will give us an opportunity then to talk about the protocol overall as well as start taking some questions from our viewers so let's play yeah. video number three and same setup but He did not want to give me that Kong. Aww. Um, do. Okay. And has he had dinner? No. Okay. Not yet. Starting, oh, sorry, get the food out. Starting timer for 22 seconds. Okay. Now it was a busy day. We had that a close. Crumble? Okay. No, just kind of an inhale, which I don't think we've been counting. Okay. Okay. Um, Good. Yeah. Wow, he might actually make it. No. Time's up. He always keeps us on our toes. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Good job. One. All right. Good. The baby's quiet all day, and then when we start this, he starts crying. Oh. He wants in on the fun. Apparently. Poor baby. 
All right, so that was an example of the, the she put the scarf up, which meant no reinforcement was going to be taking place with the scarf up. Uh, and then once the dog succeeded at staying quiet for the amount of time that you were looking at, she would take the scarf down and then provide the reinforcement. Is that correct? That's right. Um, and ultimately, uh, was, what was interesting is um, around when we got into the minutes on that, um, he started to do behaviors that were never were never the thing that he was doing when the timer went off. Because you would think like this, you know, when you deliver the reinforcer, you're going to capture whatever the dog is doing when the timer goes off. But that is not actually what he ended up doing. He ended up going over to a dog bed that had been there the whole time and just like right. curling up on it. So. All right. Well, that's good. So I think this this is prime time to ask a bunch of questions and also okay. a time uh, for us to sort of summarize what we've seen and what we're what, what some of the other solutions are to barking. So before we take some questions and, and go into more depth there, I thought it'd be a great opportunity for me to tell everybody about our on cue training treats, just because we were talking about feeding an animal and, and trying to find the right things. Our air dried high value on cue training treats are packed with healthy ingredients and irresistible flavor to help get any behavior right on cue. So check out our trainer 12 pack variety and get free shipping. Visit shop.clickertraining.com for more information. All right. We did a brief, brief promo there. And now what I want to do is I'm going to bring Juliana in as well, because I think she probably has some questions herself. Plus we've had lots of questions come in. Um, so now that you did that protocol and you were able to see how the DRO procedure worked in your master's thesis, what did you find out about that particular procedure? Is it a procedure you would use in the future? Is it a good procedure? Is it just one of many procedures to keep in mind when someone has a barking dog? Um, I think it's one of many procedures. I don't, I really don't want people to go run out and say, okay, that's what I should do if I have a dog who's barking at me on Zoom. I think each situation needs to be assessed um, individually. Um, I think there is still some work to be done on this procedure in terms of deciding how to set criteria and when to lower criteria. Sure. So I was running an experiment. So my procedures were also very rigid um, and it's kind of a shaping procedure. And I think shaping is hard to study because you have to make decisions moment by moment. But when you're doing an experiment for experimental control, you sort of want to like be able to say, well, I raised criteria this much because we, you know, like, what's your procedure? So I think a lot of times in research, you see that, like, if they do use shaping, they use shaping, but they just tell you, like, we shaped the behavior, and then they don't describe that procedure. <laughs> and then they go on to say what they did with the behavior. Um, so I feel like my criteria for lowering the time interval was too strict. Yeah. Um, and it, I sort it sort of forced the dog to get to meet the criterion at least once before I drop the criterion. And what I think that does is it it means you're using uh, extinction as your primary right. process. And I did not I didn't like that, so I would change how I would do that. But I can't say how it would work. Uh, the, the, there's with, a fine line, I think, isn't there between you know there's a lot of value in doing experiments so that we can kind of understand what's going on. But there's also the value of changing the plan to react to how your dog responds. And where do those, where do those two meet? Where does practical training and valid experimentation overlap and where do they not connect at all? I think part of it, you know, I probably could have changed my procedure more. I was a little bit unsure because it was my first time doing research too. So, um, and uh, I've done this procedure in different ways. So one way that I liked that better that I did it was, was with the dog that was barking at the caregivers when the guests were over is the, the signal, which was a towel on the doorknob at that time, sort of if this van's a rocking signal, um, uh, <laughs> was to that dog really and also enjoyed petting. So when the, the towel was up, we offered a lot of petting. So if the dog wanted petting, we had taught the dog, if I do this, it means you can come over and get scritches and stuff. Right. Um, so we made other reinforcers that maybe weren't what he was trying to bark for available. And that may have helped. 
too. That's good. Yeah. Well, we, we're, we're going to run out of time soon. So, Julian, I'd love to see if you have questions, whether it from our guests or you yourself, that you want to ask Kiki about these various different barking procedures. Yes, our viewers have had some great questions so far. But before we get into that, you've used the word antecedent quite a few times today. For those watching who don't know what that is, can you explain what an antecedent is? Yep, it's um, the environmental conditions, the relevant environmental conditions that set the stage for the behavior to happen. So cues, but also um, levels of excess and deficit, like you've, you've had a lot of exercise or you don't have access to toys. Those are all antecedent conditions that influence the, whether the behavior is likely to happen and tell, tell the dog whether the behavior is going to be probably reinforced. Thank you. Um, so Sophia is asking, and I think this shows that maybe there's room for more clarification. How do you, and this is about the two videos we just saw, how do you build that silence? Do you ignore the first seconds, uh, theoretically ignore any vocalization in the first seconds? Um, the rules are that you do ignore um, vocalization, but you also best practice for the this type of procedure, a, dif a DRO or differential reinforcement of other behavior procedure is to set the initial criteria very low so it's achievable. So um, these dogs sort of got up to usually, I, I don't have the graphs in front of me, usually got up to at least like 11 seconds from three uh, without making any mistakes. But if you DRO without any extinction, without any ignoring in this case, is basically just a, it would be a different procedure. So there is there you do ignore the barking, which is why I think it would be better to lower the criteria if the dog fails like once. I think I would like to see it lowered immediately so that we don't get don't have to do too much of that. Right. No, that that makes that makes sense. Yeah. What other questions do we have out there, Juliana? Dog on Special asks: Did you surmise that the trigger for barking was the food around a table or chair? Did you look at other contexts where food was placed in a table or chair context if there was barking? Um, no, we just uh, so we did a functional analysis, which is a little experiment to um, to test whether something is a reinforcer. Um, so what that involved was in the, in the context where the dog was barking. So in the office, um, we had a control condition where the dog got food every two seconds. And then we had a test condition where the dog got food if the dog barked or vocalized right at the beginning of vocalizing. Um, Anecdotally, and, and then you look at how, how frequent the barking is over several repetitions of that, and that you look, the data path for the control condition is like this, not much vocalization, and the data path when the dog gets food immediately upon barking was that barking was, vocalization was increasing over time. Um, anecdotally, they also had this issue if they were sitting on the couch with like a bowl of popcorn. So it wasn't just um, table and chair. And, but, and I, I guess my big question about this is, what did you take away from the study that you feel is practically, is useful practically in future situations? And does, is that, is that your go-to protocol or, or, or generally speaking, it just helped inform other protocols that you use? Um, so I, I still think the protocol of like teaching, you, you could teach your dog to relax for a long time on a mat um, and put that, you could use a scarf to start to cue that, you know, or the mat is supposed to cue that. Um, the, the issue I think with the teams that I was working with is they had kind of tried that already and they, they, it was just an extreme situation where they're on Zoom for a long period of time and like they're, actually working so they didn't have time to do it but i think you could do that the other reason i wanted to use that signal though is to protect the training so i thought maybe if we do the training um and you the person only has to be consistent when the scarf is up then the rest of the time if they muddle through maybe it won't muck up the training now my experiment was not designed to test that very well so um so with one of the teams it 
it, it seemed like other things kind of took began to cue the quiet behavior and with one of the teams it, it didn't and I there was a third team I should say where it didn't work at all and I have theories about why but um probably don't have time to get into them here <laughs> okay interesting so Juliana we probably have time for at least one more if not two more questions so we have questions about the thank you protocol because we had to save those for now. Jane is yep. wondering, how do you differentiate your thank you phrase for stopping barking from the common use of the term thank you? Um, I think it's similar to what people do with like, okay. Like, okay was always my release cue for my other dog, but I didn't say it the way I just said it in that sentence. I would be like, okay, you know? <laughs> um, so I think people go, thank you or so whatever. The, yeah, the tones, lots of things. So you feel like the the thank you, it doesn't sound like your normal thank you. Like I would agree with you if I were saying it yeah. to you right now, I've said thank you a dozen times just because I'm talking about the thank you protocol, but I don't think my dog would respond to it because I'm not saying the way I would say it to my dog might be thank you or, or something like yeah. that that would stand out so much that it's more the tone of what I'm saying than it might be the actual words thank you. Right, the same way that we know. Yeah, no, that makes sense. That's a, but that's yeah. a good question. Yeah. I can see why why a viewer would ask that question. How how about a, another question, Julianne? I think we can squeeze another one in. Where do you when working with a thank you protocol? Where do you see it typically go wrong when people try to implement it? What? Where good does it question. backfire? Um, one is that. one is where if they if you're not sure that there's something outside or there is nothing at the gate, don't do it. Because occasionally a dog will try just barking when there isn't anything there and you, that you don't want that. You you want the cue to be there's something outside. So, well, that makes sense. Right? Yeah, so that's 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 one of the things that can that can that can muck it up. I would imagine there are a number of ways that you can make the procedure not work for you. It's 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 a <laughs> it's it's a it's a, it's a fine balance, isn't it? Yeah, but people always, you know, it, it, unless you prep them for this, sometimes you'll, you'll have someone do it and be like, well, now they're barking at me whenever there's something outside to get treats. And I'm like, good, that's the goal. Right. Um, no, you're, that, you're re reinforcing less barking usually, um, and you're changing the function, you're adding a function that's something that you actually have some control over and can deliver, you can start to shape with it, you can start to reinforce less barking, turn, barking once and turning around, et cetera. So, so I, I, it seems that our, our takeaway from, from, from this past hour really is, Kiki, is one, you, you need to look at what your barking is and see if you can figure out what function it's serving for the dog. What, what is the reason for the barking? What is, what is it getting from the barking? And then use your training knowledge to try to, to shape what it is you want and, and figure that out so that there's a lot of complicated issues that come up with barking. So it's, it's, it's why, it, why it's, why it's such a complex topic, right? Yeah. And there's, of course, there are many, 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 many other procedures and ways to address different kinds of barking, um, you know, ranging from, you know, just reinforcing an alternative behavior in a really simple way to like, uh, you know, I mean, I know some people, some folks might use a timeout for what some of the stuff that I've done. I tend not to, but, um, you know. Yeah, no, that's that's a good point. And, and I agree. Timeouts can can end up being very frustrating for a dog. But I can certainly see where someone might think that that is something that they wanted to do. Well, yeah. we are, are almost at the end of our hour. Kiki, I want to thank you so much for joining us today because this has been fun hearing about your research project, but also fun and interesting as we all deal with barking and are always trying to find the best way to, 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 to cope with it. So uh, maybe we can get you back and talk about it again in the future because I I think there could be uh, a lot of different discussions we could have about barking, but this has been a lot of fun and I appreciate yeah. your time today. Um, if people, I know that there are people who had questions that weren't answered, so this might be a, a terrible idea, but um, my email address is kikiyablondogtraining at gmail.com. If you have a question, I, I can't consult with you about your particular dog, but if you have a question about what you heard that wasn't answered, I'd be happy to try and answer it.
All right, yeah. Kiki, thank you. You gave it gave everybody your email address, so feel free to reach out if you have questions about something you saw in the broadcast today. I also want to remind everybody that before I give up my time, I want to remind you that I am here at the ranch in Graham, Washington, and we offer a variety of in-person courses, seminars, and workshops. Upcoming classes include our immersive ranch experience on June 12th through the 16th. You still have a few days to register for that one. And a brand new weekend seminar about building skills through training games. And that's on June 24th and 25th. I hope to see you here and uh, learn more uh, at theranch.clickertraining.com. Also, I want to remind you that if you have suggestions, ideas, or things that you'd like to see uh, on uh, the, the, the broadcast in the future, you can submit your, uh, your questions and your suggestions uh, online. And Sarah, I appreciate, I forgot and put the things up in the wrong order. That was my fault. But you can go back to what, what is next month. Next month, live from the ranch, we have our guests, our, uh, our Brianna, Norris and uh, Pat Coven. They are the two of the instructors that teach our therapy dog training course. And we think people will love hearing about our, our new course, but also hear about how you can train your own dog or other people's dogs to be good therapy dogs. And what does it take? And what are the complicating factors? Uh, it's a great new course that we are offering. And we're going to talk about that for the entire hour. So Thank you so much for joining us today. I want to remind everybody of the offers that we had for you to visit today. Uh, we have our Karen Pryor Do Academy dog training courses from our foundation courses to our professional courses. Go to KarenPryorAcademy.com to find out more about those courses or to find out our about our KPA live classes. And you can, of course, go online to find